Luxury fashion is a waste of money. Now, I am going to tell you exactly why. But to understand how luxury fashion became a waste of money, we need to take a trip down memory lane. In the 20th century, Paris was the melting pot for budding fashion designers and couturiers. Christian Dior, Pierre Balmain, Yves Saint Laurent, Christobal Balenciaga, Coco Chanel, Elsa Schiaparelli, Hubert de Givenchy and many more designers hailing from all over France, Spain and Italy at some point settled in the French capital to pursue their dreams of creating a luxury fashion house. However, all of them had very different motivations for wanting to start a luxury fashion house. Christian Dior wanted to celebrate femininity and escape from what he had perceived as the death of French woman's style since the Second World War. The new look was his version of a return to the elegance and femininity he remembered before the war. On the flip side, Side, Coco Chanel wanted to liberate women, creating a uniform style that was comfortable and practical for women to wear. What they did all have in common was a very strong understanding of fashion and in some cases were exceptional couturiers with the ability to manipulate silhouettes and form with ease. Yves Saint Laurent and Cristobal Balenciaga especially come to mind here. In fact, Cristobal Balenciaga was so respected by his peers that Christian Dior called him the master of us all. In Italy, a similar fashion movement was going on. In 1910, Amenagildo Zenia created a luxury fabrics brand Brand. Adele and Eduardo Fendi created their namesake brand in 1925 and a few years earlier, in 1921, Guccio Gucci created his eponymous label after being inspired by the lifestyle of British aristocrats he observed when he was working as a waiter in the Savoy Hotel. Now for the most part, all of these fashion designers that created luxury fashion houses in the 20th century really dressed the highest in society. They were dressing the royals, the aristocrats, the celebrities, these were the customer base and they never ever compromised on quality. In fact, that was one of the main things that, you know, made them want to create what they wanted to create. This is why, this is why Gucci Gucci wanted to create extremely high quality leather accessories. There was a pride in the fact that people wanted to produce a product that was of the quality that royals would take to and would want to use. And when you consider that a lot of these people, their customer base was high society, it makes a lot of sense why there was this expectation anyway. The customers expected a amazing service. They expected high quality garments. They expected the best fabrics and materials to be used to create their garments. And this is the reason why the clothes were so expensive. For the most part, a lot of these clothes were made to measure and it would take a team of seamstresses, embroiderers and many more hands, days, and sometimes even weeks to make a single garment for a client. With time, as monarchy started to lose relevance, the clientele slightly shifted to the new class of rich people, which included musicians and show business moguls. And when you read about a lot of these couturiers and designers from the 20th century, they respected the craft, like I said earlier. Cristobal Balenciaga used to ask for tips from Chanel, and Chanel sort of took Cristobal Balenciaga under her wing. You have designers like Yves Saint Laurent talking about different designers that he was inspired inspired by. This super high priced clothing was a way for rich people to differentiate themselves from the rest of society. Essentially, the clothes signified their higher social standing. And of course, wearing clothing as a social signifier of where you stand in society is absolutely nothing new. People have been doing this for Ever. There were even times in the British Empire where you were not allowed to wear the same things that royals wore. So that when you would see a royal on the street, you would know that there were, you know, royals or like a nobleman. They were allowed to wear certain things that the everyday person wouldn't be allowed to wear. And this is the point where Mr. Bernard Arnault comes in. Now in fashion, we tend to pick on Bernard Arnault because Bernard Arnault is probably the most prominent person in fashion. He's a top three richest man in the world. I think right now he's the second richest man in the world. Behind Elon Musk. So for the sake of this video, I'm just going to talk about Bernard Arnault, but there are many people that do what Bernard Arnault did and they got the blueprint from him. He sort of really, really amplified this way of doing business, but there are so many conglomerates in fashion. Bernard Arnault runs LVMH, but they're also really big conglomerates like Richemont and Kering, OTB, and so many other groups. So I'm just talking about Bernard Arnault for this video. But bear in mind that there are so many other fashion conglomerates 
that do the exact same thing. Bernard Arnault studied the growth of these brands and saw a unique opportunity to use the fact that these brands were so unattainable as a marketing point to sell cheaper consumer products that can generate more money. He saw how well fragrances like Chanel No. 5 sold and started acquiring fashion brands like Dior and later Givenchy. Now, a very good source on learning how luxury fashion has changed over time is this really amazing book by Dana Thomas called How Luxury Lost Its Luster. I'll actually leave a link to this in the comment section and in the description below. But essentially, it just talks about how luxury fashion has changed over time. Now, I will be quoting this book a lot because the information in this book is amazing. And it's quite interesting that this book came out in 2007, but all the information is so relevant. And that shows how ahead of sort of the market Dana Thomas was when she was writing this book to really break down exactly what's going on right now. Now, bear in mind that this book came out in 2007. So a lot of the figures that she quotes in the book are probably, you can multiply all those figures by 10, if not more. So to quote something that it says, she wrote, the luxury goods industry, as it is known today, is a $157 billion business that produces and sells clothes, leather goods, shoes, silk scarves and neckties, watches, jewelry, perfume, and cosmetics that convey status and a pampered life, a luxurious life. 35 major brands control 60% of the business and dozens of smaller companies account for the rest. Several, including Louis Vuitton, Gucci, Prada, Giorgio Armani, Hermes, and Chanel have annual revenues in excess of $1 billion. Most luxury goods companies that we know today were started a century or more ago as a simple one man or one woman shop that sold beautiful handcrafted pieces. Today, those companies still carry the founder's name, but are for the most part owned and run by tycoons who in the last two decades have turned them into multi-billion dollar corporations and omnipresent global brands. They cluster their stores on main city avenues, in airports, in outlet malls. Their advertisements fill magazines and blanket billboards. Their primary customers are upper income women between 30 and 50 years old. In Asia, the customer base veers younger, starting at 25. And that really explains why Bernard Arnault is the reason why luxury fashion right now is made terribly. If we talk about LVMH as a company, when Bernard Arnault really started using LVMH to acquire brands, it was publicly traded. Now, if there's anything you know about a publicly traded company, you have shareholders. And what do shareholders want? They want profit. So a lot of these brands were handcrafted. They were made to measure. They turn these brands into ready-to-wear brands where you can buy stuff off the rack. Most of the stuff isn't bespoke unless it's like an oud couture piece, which is very very rare, almost no one buys that anymore. The stuff isn't handcrafted, of course. There are a lot of assembly lines, a lot of the production has been outsourced to third world countries where a lot of the production cost is less, also the labor laws are less so, so these brands can get away with doing a lot of things that they wouldn't if they still produced in Italy or France. In this book, it's quite funny, uh, Dana Thomas was talking about the fact that a lot of these brands, they used to produce in Italy and France, but what they do now is, let's say they produce in China or Indonesia or wherever, and then they just change the label in France or Italy and that is enough for them to legally say that it's made in France or Italy. So a lot of people buy these things thinking that their stuff is made in a European country but it's actually not. The garment construction got a lot worse because they couldn't put the amount of time and care into quality control and just making sure the products are a good grade of quality because they're trying to sell more and with the scale that some of these brands sell these days it's actually very hard to quality control accurately. So that's another thing that happened. Another one is they actually just use cheaper and less high grade fabrics in a lot of their clothes. And I think worst of all is they started to astronomically increase their prices despite everything about these garments being worse. I think it's quite insane. And the funny thing about how luxury fashion is marketed right now is Bernard Arnault has this way of using LVMH and the way they market is they talk about history a lot. So they talk about the history of Chris and Dior. Chris and Dior is one of the greatest designers of our generation, the new look, the bar suit and you use that history to sell a t-shirt and to sell perfume and to sell cosmetic. That has nothing to do with hand making very very complicated dresses for his customers. They are so completely different but I find it really interesting how they can use that as a marketing tool to sell different things and I'm going to read a quote from the book that sort of speaks about this further. Corporate tycoons and financiers saw the potential. They bought or took over luxury companies from elderly founders or incompetent heirs. They turned the 
houses into brands and homogenized everything. The stores, the uniforms, the products, even the coffee cups in the meetings. Then they turned their sights on a new target audience, the middle market. That broad socioeconomic demographic that includes everyone, from teachers and sales executives, to high-tech entrepreneurs, McMansion suburbanites, the ghetto fabulous, even the criminally wealthy. The idea, luxury executives explained, was to democratize luxury, to make luxury accessible. It all sounded so noble. Heck, it sounded almost communist, but it wasn't. It was as capitalist as could be. The goal, plain and simple, was to make as much money as heavenly possible. To realize this democratization, the tycoons launched a two-pronged attack. First, they hyped their brands mercilessly. They trumpeted the brand's historical legacy and the tradition of hand craftsmanship to give the products an air of luxury legitimacy. They encouraged their designers to stage extravagant or provocative fashion shows at a million dollars a pop to drum up controversy and to make headlines. They spent billions of dollars on deliberately shocking advertising campaigns, Dior's grease smudged lesbian ads to sell purses, Yves Saint Laurent's full frontal male nudity shop to sell perfume. This made their brands as recognizable and common as Nike and Ford. They dressed celebrities who in return told every reporter lining the red carpet which company had provided their gown, jewels, handbag, tuxedo, or shoes. They began to sponsor high-profile sporting and entertainment events such as Louis Vuitton at the America's Cup and Chopard at the Cannes Film Festival. The message was clear, buy our brand and you too will live a luxury life. And that brings us to the current day where luxury fashion really isn't luxury anymore and something really funny I've found on the internet on Twitter and, and just conversations about fashion that people are having is people are now trying to change the meaning of what luxury is. I've heard, I feel like this is kind of coming from the people that own these brands where you hear a lot of in the conversations now people are saying things like luxury is what it means to you luxury is not just about quality but now luxury is about a feeling it's about how it makes you feel i'm like if you're gonna charge me two thousand to ten thousand dollars for a product it has to be high quality i don't care how it makes me feel that's all i feel like that discourse has actually been created by these brands to kind of sidestep making high quality garments but this is actually why it gets really complicated because the luxury brands are the heritage brands that were made by these 20th century designers and people bought them up and are using them to market subpar products. Okay, cool. But within these brands, they also make things that are really good quality. Like Hermes, for example, is known for making really good quality bags. Chanel makes good quality bags, but their ready to wear is horrible. Like Chanel's makes jewelry that's like show jewelry. The quality of Chanel jewelry is terrible. The quality of a lot of Chanel's footwear, awful. The quality of Prada's footwear, awful, but then Prada makes coats that are really good quality. So then past that, it gets to the point where every brand does things that are good quality and are bad, and you have to know what the difference is. So then you have to learn as a consumer what brand does quality stuff, what garments do they do that are high quality, what garments aren't, which is actually a shame because with the prices that some of these brands charge, everything should be well made. I mean, geez, my friend had Prada derbies and they disconnected from the sole completely because they were glued together and they weren't stiff. It's insane. Like if you're gonna make loafers and the intention is not to make you know it flexible they need to be good year welted if you don't want it to be flexible if you want it to be flexible there are other high quality methods of making it but these brands just get away with murder some of these garments like a air jordan one is better constructed than a lot of luxury footwear that i see a good example is i've always for the longest wanted gucci horse bit loafers because I like what they signify historically. I like the whole story of Gucci Gucci seeing, you know, aristocrats going on horses. One of the early products that Aldo Gucci came up with were the horse bit loafers. Cool, whatever. But I go into the Gucci store and I hold these loafers and the quality is so bad. As much as I want the loafers, I cannot justify spending that money on a product that is just that badly made. There's a brand, a footwear brand in the UK called Trickers. Trickers make really, really high quality shoes. They're known, they're like British heritage, they have a royal warrant, the royals in the UK wear trickers. It's so funny that Gucci loafers cost more than trickers loafers. And trickers loafers aren't cheap. That is 
it's so insane to me. It's so insane. And as much as I say luxury fashion is a waste of money in the title, I think it just depends. There are brands that care about craftsmanship and also you can have different reasons for buying clothes. Like I have many different reasons why I buy clothes. Sometimes I buy clothes because the shape of the actual garment or the design of a footwear is just a shape I can't buy anywhere else. So in that case, I might buy the shoe because I just really like the shape, even if it might be less quality because I just can't find it anywhere else. That is definitely a thing that can be a reason why you buy clothing or you like the design that you can't find anywhere else. Then some brands like Rick Owens, they have really outlandish designs, but the quality is also really good. It's quality that I can vouch for. There are also a lot of brands in Japan, especially where they'll just have like a small shop and you walk into the shop, they don't even have any Instagram and you walk in there and it's just some really high quality denim and jackets and stuff. So I think now more so than ever, especially now when a lot of luxury brands, quote unquote, luxury brands, the big houses, their collections are so boring and so dry that if you enjoy high quality fashion, the last place you should look is these big heritage houses. I think for majority of you, if you like high quality clothing, I think you should look elsewhere. I think you should support independent designers that actually you know, care about the clothing. It tends to be the case that most people start their brands with the best intentions, but as time progresses, and as they get bought by a conglomerate and then shareholders get involved, that is what then tends to water down the brand. So most of the brands that are high quality now is because they've gone through generations without being owned by a conglomerate. And once they're owned by a conglomerate, the quality goes down. This is not just a fashion thing, by the way. I'm really into fragrances and perfumes. The same thing happens in perfumes. You hear so many times of companies like Estee Lauder acquiring the rights to a fragrance company and all of a sudden they reformulate all the fragrances and they use cheaper materials and then you spray the fragrance on your body and it used to last 10 hours, now it lasts five hours. Happens in every single sector. To end the video, I'm gonna read a paragraph from this book. The luxury industry has changed the way people dress. It has realigned our economic class system. It has changed the way we interact. It has become a part of our social fabric. To achieve this, it has sacrificed its integrity, undermined its product, tarnished its history, and hoodwinked its consumers. In order to make luxury accessible, tycoons have stripped away all that has made it special. Luxury has lost its luster. So on that note, what I will say is definitely check this book out if you're interested in this. I think it's an amazing book just to read in general, even if you're not that into fashion, just to know like how the business of fashion works and just other stuff like that. Um, so I'll leave a link to this in the description below. On my Patreon, if you want to subscribe to my Patreon, I'm currently actually reviewing the whole book chapter by chapter. So I've done the intro and next week I'm gonna continue, you know, reviewing the book. And we're also going through a documentary series that's called Kingdom of Dreams, which is actually a documentary series inspired by this book. Um, so if you wanna learn more about what I've been talking about, definitely check this book out, but also try to watch the documentary series, Kingdom of Dreams. Now on that note, thank you very much for watching. Comment down below a fashion man that you think makes really high quality things and I'll be back with another video very soon. I just realized the more and more I edit the video that it looks like throughout the video on this part of my eye, I have like eye crust. You know the eye crust that when um, like you sleep, sometimes you fall asleep and then you have that like white crust on your eye. I just want to clarify, it's not eye crust. I do um, Muay Thai and a few days ago, I got elbowed really badly <laughs> in the eye. So I've had to put like, this powder, but now there's like nothing there, but I had an injury. I still have other injuries from Muay Thai, like there's a cut here. I'm not sure if you can see that there. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. I don't want people to be like, oh my God, you like slept and woke up and didn't like clean his eye or whatever. Like it's literally powder. It was either that or my eye just wouldn't heal on time. Yeah, so just thought I'd clarify that.